So Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. I'm so thrilled to talk to you. You are um, one of my dream guests, I have to say. When I started the podcast, you were definitely one of the people that I was like, oh, that would be so cool <laughs> if I could talk to Susan Verity. So I'm so glad you're here. And I want to learn all about you and your journey in yoga, mindfulness, and being an author. So let's start at the beginning of, of yoga for you. When did you first start practicing yoga and mindfulness? Um, I started pra practicing yoga when I was probably late teens, early 20s. Um, I was, you know, I was a very anxious kid, teenager, um, and tried various ways to sort of cope with that and manage that. And um, it was just a, a really good friend of mine who brought me, sort of dragged me to a class. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I, I just remember, I mean, I know it sounds very cliche, but I just sort of remembered, you know, it was such a non-judgmental atmosphere. And, and I just like, the teacher was so wise and I didn't feel, you know, I saw people just lying in Shavasana, like it, there wasn't this pressure to get everything perfect and do every, and I had all these ideas about what it was going to be like. Um, and I just, I was just kind of hooked. It was like that first class gave me a glimpse of what it could be like to kind of quiet the chatter. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that just got me hooked. And then from there, I just wanted to learn everything and know everything and practice all the time. And it just kind of morphed into um, meditation and specifically mindful, mindfulness meditation as my practice progressed. I loved, you know, I've done, I, I, I've done transcendental meditation and other forms of meditation, but there's something about mindfulness meditation that I really love because again it sort of gives me an anchor you know and and can quiet the chatter and 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 sort of make it so i'm not you know caught up in all the feelings and all of that so um all of those things started in my 20s and there are practices that and i don't know if it's the same for you but you know, sometimes you step away and then you go back and you're like, oh my gosh, why, why did mm -hmm. I step away from this at all? Um, you know, I've gone back in, in times of distress or when I was going through my divorce or things like that, like those just became my go-to mm -hmm. practices. So, yeah, I find that too. It's in those most challenging times in my life where it's like, I come right back to it. Yeah. And it's there, thank God. And it's like, why have, it's like you said, why haven't I been doing this all along? But what's wrong with me? Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad, I'm glad it's there. So you kind of stuck with it from when you were a teenager. I stuck with it. I think, you know, I, I, I stepped back from it a little when I was, um, when I was going to school to get my, um, degree in elementary education mm -hmm. things like that I just you know I felt like there wasn't enough time or there wasn't so I stepped away and then I realized that like you need to make time so I I re-engaged but there were yeah but it but it's that's sort of when the journey started yeah me. it's so it's so great that you learned at that young um and I think that's the gift a lot of kids yoga teachers are giving now is to to even younger children or even you know we could start as young as babies uh, it's just i mean huge. i wish that i had known about it uh when i was in you know elementary school yeah because it it i mean these kids and we have so much stress and so many things but i i, I think kids today they they have such a gift um because these practices exist, because they know they're like allowed to consider their feelings, they're mm -hmm. able to think about. Whereas I, I know when I was a child, I mean, it wasn't something I even thought I should think about, you know? Right. I'm just like you just plow right through and sort of. Exactly. Exactly. There's so much more awareness now. Yeah. So when did you then decide you wanted to share yoga and mindfulness with children? It actually wasn't until a little bit later. Um, so I was an elementary school teacher for about 12 years. And, um, you know, I kind of 
infused my classroom with a little bit of, you know, we, I had my, my sort of peace corner, which had some kind of breathing things and Hoberman spheres and, you know, stuff like that. But um, I didn't really think about it as sort of teaching yoga and mindfulness directly. So it was after, it was after that, it was after I finished teaching. I stopped teaching because I was um, trying to have kids and it became more of an ordeal than mm -hmm. I had hoped. So I took time off from teaching, then I had my children and then I really wanted to re-engage with kids in the classroom, but I also didn't want to sort of commit to that amount of time. Um, and I thought, you know, what is the best way that I can be there, support the kids, support the teachers, but like also be able to be home with my own kids. And, and it was like this light bulb moment, this aha, like, oh my God, of course, yoga and mindfulness, mm. like, what a gift for these kids. And when I started, you know, it was really just, it felt like it was kind of just getting into the school system. Right. Um, there was definitely some pushback from a lot of places, but mm -hmm. it was just getting in there. So, so it was a little bit later along the journey. Right. Yeah. It's like you were already doing it. It sounds like in your teaching, like you were already incorporating it, but this was when you realized, oh, I could, I could really do this on its own. Right. It was my really intention there. Intentional. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now when did your books come about? So did you always want to be a children's book author? I know. I mean, I didn't, no. it's not that I didn't, didn't want to be one, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't <laughs> something I, I thought about. I mean, I loved um, books. I loved reading. I loved writing. I loved all of those things as sort of a way to care for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hadn't thought about it as a career. Um, I think once I started teaching and I was, you know, just this avid picture book collector, um, and felt, really fell in love with picture books as a way to uh, jumpstart conversations about big topics, right? With little mm. kids. Um, it wasn't, I, I was just sort of writing for myself. Again, it all kind of happened. Everything kind of happened. Like <laughs> after I stopped teaching and while I was, you know, at home raising my kids, I think it probably a lot of the writing and the teaching and all of that was, you know, a, a coping mechanism. Right. I had three kids, I had twins and then a third right away. And so it was just, it was just like a lot. Wow. And so that was sort of my way of practicing, right? Was the writing and the teaching and all of those things, um, keeping my, myself sane. So yeah, the, the, the thoughts about becoming an author came a little bit later. Um, I, I had been writing for myself for, you know, just writing. And, and I ha had this stack of stuff. And um, at a certain point, I, I, I did decide like, maybe, I, maybe this could be a thing. Maybe this could be something. And at that point, I started putting myself out there a little bit more. And I was, uh, I went to a children's literature conference that they hold every summer near where I live in, in Southampton. And um, I took Peter Reynolds, the illustrator, mm. the illustrator I took his uh, workshop. And one of the perks was being able to show him your work. So I, you know, shoved this huge pile <laughs> of stuff in front of his face. And, uh, and he pulled out uh, a poem I had written called The Museum and he said, well, this is a this is a book, and and I want to illustrate it. And I was like, what? Whoa! <laughs> and uh, so we spent the next six months like creating this dummy. I worked on the text, and he did sketches, and we put together a little, you know, dummy book on on index cards, mm. and mailed it off to his agent. And within two weeks, it had sold. So that, and then it just. Wow. So that's how you met him and started collaborating. That's how I met him. Yeah. So we've known each other a really long time and um, it was a very unique way of getting into that world. Yeah. That is so cool. Cause I love all of your collaborations. I love, I mean, the, the I am series you guys have done and. Peter is just, you know, I've, I've been so fortunate with all of my illustrators. They just, um, they're just amazing. And I'm, I'm always in awe because 
how do you take this text and then become inspired mm. to, to draw these pictures that bring the whole thing to life? I, I just, I'm fascinated by it. Um, but it's really a pleasure to write uh, for Peter. There's just some kind of, I don't know, we share a sensibility. So it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah. So tell me about your writing process. I mean, I'm sure it, it morphs and changes over time, but how does it typically work for you? Do you get an idea first or do you, do you just start writing? Like where do you, where do you, you have so many books out? Where, where did they all come from? Um, I, I, so far I tend to have the idea first and sometimes I have a lot of ideas and then I start, you know, playing with each one of them and I'm like, oh, this is not, Mm. That's not happening, but this one might be okay. Um, so yeah, the, uh, so far it's the idea. And then from there, I figure out, well, what is it about this idea that I want to, you know, what, what, what is it that I'm trying to explore? Um, and I was just, I had a school visit today, if you can believe there's still school going on. Mm. And uh, I was talking about, you know, rough drafts and how I have gosh, six, seven, eight rough drafts. And my first one, the worst one, is always the one where I get just every thought in my head out about this, whatever this is that I'm thinking. Um, and it's pretty terrible. But then the exciting part happens and you get to go back and, you know, really mm -hmm. hone in on what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so far it's been the idea. The I Am series, that actually... I, the intention wasn't to have a series in the beginning. It started with just the one book, I Am Yoga. Um, mm. Actually, my editor at Abrams said, why haven't you written a yoga book? You're like out there teaching me. Well, like, why are you? Said, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good idea. Right. Um, but I was really intentional about it because I, I didn't want to write an instructional book. I mean, I know there are instructions in the back so that you can get into the poses safely or what have you, but um, I really just wanted to kind of capture what I was seeing with the kids, right? Yeah. That they, yeah. they feel things, they use their imagination, they, you know, they express themselves. Like I, I just wanted to kind of capture how it can make you feel. Um, and so that was, that was my intention with that. And then from there, it was sort of like, oh, well, if we're doing a yoga book, we should probably do a mindfulness book. And then it just, hmm. and there just seemed to be all kinds of things to continue to talk about. Yeah. I have to tell you, I hadn't yet read it, but just read last night to my daughter, um, I Am One. And I was like, I was in tears because oh. it's so beautiful. <laughs> and my daughter is five and she was listening and sometimes when I'm reading to her she's like moving around and it's like seems like she's not listening you know how they're kids do that and they're yeah. always listening and she saw the illustration of the wall and that them not they're taking bricks out of a wall and she was like mommy that's not nice they're knocking down a wall and I said I said oh maybe it's a wall like in zombies it's this Disney movie where the zombies live separately from the people and there's a wall between. Oh. And then in the movie, the zombies are starting to basically become integrated into their school. And so I said, oh, maybe it's a wall like that, that's separating that shouldn't really be there. And she's like, okay. And then we read the whole thing. And at the end, they're building the path with, with bricks. And I probably wouldn't have put it together. She's like, oh, look, they're using the bricks now to, to build a path to connect. And I was like, Oh my, I was just like, it, it just, it makes me tear up now because she got it, you know, and the message was so beautiful, but I know it's for children, but that message right now is just, I mean, so important. I feel like, I mean, and that's again, sort of the beauty of picture books, right? They, they can take these big messages and break them down in a way that kids can make those connections, but then the adults reading them also get mm -hmm. something. I mean, I don't really consciously think about, oh, I've got to appeal to the adults and the kids. And the, right. But I do think kids are smart 
they will understand this and what they don't understand they'll understand at a different point or what they don't understand um, their their caregivers their adults will uh, have a conversation about it with them you know um, the book I am human actually was interesting because our publisher at first didn't want that title they said, oh, it's too clunky, you know, kids, they don't, they don't understand that sort of I'm mm -hmm. only human idea. And we were like, of course they do. Of course they get it. Right. Oh, it can't be anything else but that. And we had to fight for that title. But, mm -hmm. you know, they get it. And what they don't get then is an opening for a discussion for, you know, taking it a little bit further. I mean, the word empathy, the word resilience, all of yeah. those things. There's so, you know, um, I mean, I'm so glad that that I'm, I'm filled with gratitude that your daughter got it and that you got something from it and that you all had this kind of experience mm -hmm. together. And that's, that's the dream. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you see it a lot with, you know, doing author visits and things like that. Um, how has that changed, by the way, since the pandemic began? So your work as an author, where I'm, I'm sure you were doing more in-person things, um, completely shifted. So when the pandemic started, like, what did you, what did you do? Yeah, I mean, well, at first, you know, I was very. So one of the really wonderful things about this whole journey is that I do get to go into schools and stay connected with teachers and students and. You know, most of the time when I'm when I'm visiting, I, I mean, I do sort of a combination of, you know, um, talking about being an author and then also mindfulness and yoga. They typically mm -hmm. everybody wants some some part of that um, in the visit uh, um, or I do, you know, writers workshops, but I still incorporate those things in into those visits. And so when the pandemic hit and there was no more travel. I mean, well, first of all, I was, you know, worried about my making a living because those yeah. help support my life and my family. Um, but what was really amazing to me is that there was about there were about two weeks where I sort of went into complete panic mode, and then I started to see and and be a part of um, the kid lit community that was just suddenly stepping up and offering, you know, offering themselves, offering read alouds, offering anything they could, no, you know, no charge, no nothing, because everyone was just, mm -hmm. nobody knew what was going on. And, and I started doing some meditations online. And so everything, everything shifted, um, but it also what opened up the space to just be present to just you know to just give what you could to just stay connected um and then there was a very quiet period where nothing was really going on um and then around mid-january school started reaching out for virtual author visits and it's very um it's very different you know it, mm. it it's it can be challenging uh, because you don't get that feedback. So you're not really able to have a conversation. Everybody's muted or, you know, um, some platforms. Once I start sharing my screen, I see no one. I'm just talking right. to <laughs> for 45 minutes. <laughs> no, <laughs> that they're listening or getting something out yeah. of it. Um, so it's really hard to kind of, but I kind of have to just, okay, you know, back, back, <laughs> sort of go and just do my thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a shift for sure, but, uh, it's kind of cool because, um, there's more, more people can join than before. Right. And, um, I don't ever have to wear shoes. That's true. That's really a bonus. <laughs> Um, you know, my animals can make live appearances <laughs> right. uh, and, and it's, it just, I mean, I'm just so glad that, that it's available, you know, and that they, I'm still able to share yoga and mindfulness and all of the, you know, things that I could before. It's just, it feels a little more awkward. Um, but 
it's still it's still there. And so things started to pick up a little bit around then. And like I said, they're just, I think I'm my last visit tomorrow. And then I, I think that's it until. Yeah. And then hopefully some in-person things start happening again. Oh, I, I really, really hope so. Yeah. I mean, what about you? Are you teaching in person? Or are you? No, no. I've just, um, I started this podcast right before the pandemic. And this is what I've been continuing to do. It was actually, I was glad I had it when the yeah. pandemic started. Um, so my focus really now, and it made me realize I, I do miss teaching in person and I do want to get some classes started, but um, it made me realize that my passion is really um, talking to more adults who are sharing yoga with children because right. each of us reach so many kids. So to be able to connect all of us, I think is a really powerful thing. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I mean, I think in some ways, yeah, things did um, open up or there were, you know, lessons learned. I mean, I, I felt like, um, you know, I, I can say no to things or I can mm -hmm. offer a virtual experience versus always having to be away. Um, so pros and cons. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I want to hear about um, the newest book that I saw, I think is coming out in September. Oh, yes. So, so well, tell me about this, this new one. Um, the new one, it's called uh, I Am Courage, a book of resilience. The interesting thing about these books that I've seen, you know, I, I, when you write a book from the time you come up with the idea uh, to the time that the book is out in the world, it's minimum a year. So you really don't know what's going to be happening in the world when your book is actually out there. Um, but I feel like it's sort of perfect timing because, you know, if, if we've learned nothing else, we've learned that we are resilient, um, that we are all very courageous um, and I feel like that needs to be acknowledged and discussed and celebrated. Um, so that's what this book is, is all about. It's just, it's basically that. It's about how we, how we can be brave. Um, and that doesn't mean always, uh, you know, doing the things we're afraid of. It just means acknowledging the fear and making a choice. Um, and trying again, or trying something different, or asking for help, or all of the things that mm -hmm. make us courageous. Uh, so that, and I'm super excited. It's a little bit uh, different. It was a more challenging one, probably to illustrate because I mean, Peter's brilliant. So obviously he can illustrate, but just in that it's a little, um, a little less concrete. Right. So he really, he just did a fantastic job. I can't. And when did you, did you start writing this during the pandemic or prior to? No, I actually had written this manuscript probably two years ago. Wow. Okay. Well, it, it's really fitting in with the times, like oh. you said. I mean, <laughs> plan it that way, but yeah. yeah. It's Wonderful. Well, I'm ex very excited. Oh my gosh. I'm very excited too. I really oh. am. And just a little, I'm just so curious a little bit about your process with Peter Reynolds, the illustrator that we've been talking about. Um, does it, how does that work? Do you usually send him the text and then he starts thinking up ideas and then you go back and forth? Like, how does that go? So in the, in the publishing world, typically, um, when you have written a manuscript and you give it to your editor, um, they then share it with the illustrator and um, you don't communicate. You, you, I don't hear anything. Um, we don't talk and at some point, sometimes the editor will share sketches just to sort of make sure it's all feeling good. Um, maybe if there's any little text changes that need to happen or whatever and then you see the the nearly finalized layout, hmm. um, but there's sort of this 
uh, rule that you're not supposed to speak to each other. So oh. although it's a collaboration, it's so when Peter and I did the museum, when we sold the book, the museum, we had a little celebratory cocktail or whatever with the editor and the, our agents and all of that. And the editor said, well, you guys know now that you can't talk to each other about this. And we were like, <laughs> sure. Um, but it's a little different with me and Peter. Um, we do still the editor will be the one sharing the manuscript um, and then but we do communicate um, often he'll have questions about maybe what what i'm thinking and then he plays off of that or um you know i'll change something or have a thought that i'd like to share with him uh, and so there is a little bit of back and forth and he does always send me a little sneak peek at like the main character or there's something like that yeah and I typically burst into tears because it's so beautiful <laughs> I'm sure. and, and then that's how it goes so we do we do you know we probably do communicate more than than is typical that's so interesting I did not realize that yeah it's weird right it's sort of it is. because you would think that you'd be like back and forth yeah. I have this feeling that a long time ago, something went really wrong <laughs> right. between those two. And somebody was like, nope, right. you're not a middleman and you're not yeah. each other. You know, what? it's like having when when creative people, two creative people are working together. I always picture it like I'm creative. My mind is very swirly. So I'm a very swirly person. But it's like you kind of need those people that think more in the straight lines yeah. to just like rein it in a little, I oh guess. My God. Thank God for my agent, because she'll do that. Too. We'll talk to each other and I'll be like, oh, and then I'm not. she's like, bring it, bring it in, Susan. Just bring it in. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think you're right. They definitely need you need somebody who's like, yeah, yeah. We need all all these kinds of people. Then yeah. then we can have beautiful books like your books. Well, so outside of the writing, just you personally, how did you take care of yourself? this past year? I mean, in the beginning, I sort of, I dropped everything. I was really afraid. And I think I just went into that sort of like, like flight or freeze. I was just mm -hmm. kind of frozen. I mean, I couldn't be entirely frozen because I had three children to deal with, but, um, but it, I was scared. And, and I, I did for just a little while, let my practices kind of go. And then I realized like, oh no, this is what I need. So um, I made sure, you know, I was doing yoga every day and meditating every day and uh, talking to the people who, um, who I really connected with. You know, I sort of, I have really good friends who we just kind of didn't, didn't speak a lot during the pandemic the, or the worst of it. I can't say that we're completely out of it, but there were some, there were just, I don't know. I tried to, to, to be very intentional and sort of, uh, you know, foster the relationships that were really nourishing and just to kind of um, remind myself every day that in this moment, we're okay. You know, we, we're, all the things that we have to be grateful for. We have a roof over our heads. We have food. We have paper towel. You know, we have the trees. We have all of that, and we have each other. And um, I, I, it was a lot of reminding myself. It was a lot of, um, you know, I had to be active about it. It would have, would have been very easy to just kind of crawl under the covers. And uh, so, yeah. And, and I tried to kind of stay with some of my routines. So even if I wasn't leaving the house to, you know, go to a class, I would do something on Zoom or, um, you know, I would take a walk outside or all, all of those things to really, uh, and I, you know, I, I tried to continue eating healthy and I tried to do all of, all of those things. And I took advantage of the time that I had with my children because they're all teenagers and when they're home they're mostly in their rooms <laughs> mm -hmm. um and so i try to kind of uh really stay connected you know and and understand that like at some point soon they're going to be off 
the college or wherever. And so this time is rare. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I yeah. get together. Yeah, the, the part you said about the nourishing relationships that really resonated because there was a certain clarity that came during the pandemic where it was like any kind of BS, just there's no, <laughs> there's no room for it, no time. And it really clarified it's like going through a strainer or something like the relationships that were healthy and the ones that weren't, or, you know, that, and that yeah. was one plus, I guess, if we, you know, if we look at the silver linings, I think things became more clear in that way. You know, it was interesting. I took, um, so I, I took an outdoor spin class, um, like, I don't know, a month ago when things sort of started getting a little mm -hmm. bit better and, and um, the, you know, we were very spread out and it was all very safe. Yeah. But, um, but the teacher said, um, as the world begins to open back up again, just be aware and intentional about what you let back in. And I thought that was so, you know, mm -hmm. obvious, but interesting because we did make these kind of discoveries about ourselves and our relationships and things like that. And do we need to be in a rush to let it all back in again. Right. And you know, where I live in, in East Hampton is a very um, uh, seasonal place. Although during the pandemic, everybody who had a summer home moved out here. Like, yes. Permanently. Yes. But, um, but I have noticed in the last maybe week or so when people have started, when the mask mandates have dropped and people, and the energy is frantic. It's mm. just sort of back to the way it was pre. And I, I thought to myself, like, have you not learned anything? Like, why are we yeah. in this crazy? Don't we know that it's a little better to kind of slow it down? And right. I know it. That that feels like such a sensory overload to me. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah. Too, too much. Too much. Too much, and you know, yeah. why? Why are we getting angry online at the deli? Like, right. it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Did, did we not learn? That's not right. important. Like, it's, what? Um, right. Yeah. So it's you know, it's an interesting experiment. This whole thing. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's. Yeah, I feel like what it feels like right now is like my head's like a little bit like out of the water <laughs> you know it's like, like they're taking some breaths but like I'm still in the water and I think uh, some people are just water. jumping oh my God, right some up. people are on land running around <laughs> <laughs> like, they just took not off ready. <laughs> but no I'm not quite ready yet either yeah um, I keep wearing you know I'm wearing my mask everywhere yeah. and I go into a place and no one's wearing masks and I'm like yeah it's jarring I don't understand the rules what right. is happening like <laughs> I know such a weird in-between state I know <sighs> well we need that resilience that you're writing about you know <laughs> we have it we have it but yeah, no for sure we do we do and I think you know for kids I mean I'm sure your kids it's it's feeling better for them and that. That was, I think that was the hard, after, after I had my little meltdown and I allowed that for myself, um, you know, I think the hardest part for me was helping my kids or seeing what they were going through mm -hmm. and not being able to help them because, yeah. you know, they, as teenagers, they are not meant to be at home with their mother 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> They're supposed to be out doing all kinds of scary things and I'm supposed to be at home worrying about them. But I mean, they, you know, they are, they are supposed, they are social yeah. beings. They, and that was so hard um, to see, to always have to say no, to, you know, make them mm -hmm. distance from everyone. It was just, I felt like the bad guy all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I also felt sort of helpless because. Right. Cause we didn't know either. We were oh. just doing our best. We didn't know what was happening. And when no. it would end and when, yeah. No, yeah, it was the, so that, that was the trickiest. And yours are, are younger, right? They're yeah, um, my daughter was five when it started. My son was one, now he's two. So he's concerned too. So 
Yeah, I mean, my two-year-old, he's just happy. At, you know, he didn't know, but my daughter for sure knew because school stopped and she couldn't see her friends. And yeah. But um, we've since moved and she's just started um, making some new friends. I'm just elated to see her with other kids and playing. So good, right? Because I'm like, I can't be the playmate anymore. Like I literally got nothing left, you know, and it was to yeah. be the, to be everything to our kids. It, like you said, it's not natural that. No, it's not. And it's really hard. And, you know, I had uh, one child who sort of went into shutdown mode and, um, you know, they still had to pass their classes. <sighs> so, I mean, school just seemed to go on anyway. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I, I said, I said to, um, my my child Sophia I was like one of the like biggest perks about being an adult is that I don't have to do homework and now here I am you're doing <laughs> doing homework like <laughs> no no sucked back into that world <laughs> yeah please uh well are they back in person in school now were they um so they go to yeah. three different schools so I had okay. one who was in boarding school in Florida actually and they were it was a boarding and day school um it was very strange so he actually ended up living with some friends off campus for the year but he was in person every day hmm. and then his brother his twin brother who was home he was uh in person every day and then Sophia was, um, had the option of being online or doing a hybrid thing. Um, and they opted to be online. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So it was a whole Every, yeah. push -push of everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, get, we're, we're getting there. I think we're getting, you know, making progress. Lock on everything, right? I know, I know. Well, I love to um, kind of seal these conversations with little gems. And for you, who's been, you know, sharing yoga with kids in different compa capacities for so long, um, what would your one piece of advice be for people, someone who's sharing yoga with children, your little gem? My little gem. You know, uh, I think what I would say um, is that you, you have your plan, right? You have your idea, you have your, your, your class plan, your structure of the way things want to be, the way you want things to be, all of that. But then um, just let it go. Whatever happens, happens. The experience is the experience. And just as you wouldn't want them to be hard on themselves about any of it, don't be hard on yourself about any of it because it, it will never go as expected. It will never go as smoothly as you want. There will be days where it's like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest. But just be able to, to treat yourself with the kindness of the experience in the same way you would your students. Yes, 100%. That's so that is, I feel like the, at the bottom line of all of it. Plan, um, plan for sure. But then, yeah, let it go, <laughs> surrender. Surrender. Exactly. And the kindness to yourself is huge. It is huge. And I say it from experience, right? I, I mean, you know, you have a plan yeah. and you go in there and like nothing works. Mm -hmm. And you're, you just walk out thinking, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the worst teacher ever. I am, this is terrible. Yeah. How, how could I possibly be sharing? But you're there. You showed up. You did the work. You connected, surrender. Yeah, it's good. yeah, it's all good. Absolutely, and those, when you teach long enough, you have those kind of classes. And then in that same class, you hear from a student who then went home and did yoga before bed or something. And you're exactly. like, what? You all from a parent who's like, my child was in the corner meditating. And you're like, what? That yeah. wasn't even paying attention. Right, exactly, exactly, so yeah. I love that so much. Well, I want people to, I'm sure people know who you are already, but if they want to buy your books or learn more about you, where are the best places to go? Oh, um, 
Thank you for letting me share that. So um, you can find out all about where to buy the books and everything on my website, just susanverde.com. Um, but the books are available. I always say go to your local bookstore first, support local bookstores. Um, and then they're also available on the other online mm -hmm. websites. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you can always visit my website and there the links are all there. Um, and then I'm I'm always on Instagram at Susan Verde. Um, and you can sign up for my newsletter and you can send me an email and we can connect in all those various ways. So awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to Lara Hawkeiser who ah. introduced us Great. and connected us. She's wonderful. Um, and just, I really appreciate you taking the time. I love talking to you. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. This was so nice. <laughs> I'm so surprised my kids have been quiet. Right, I know, <laughs> me too. What? <laughs> I was waiting for the doors to slam. Right, <laughs> right. Mom, where's my food or something like that. But we got through, we, we did, did it. it. We did it, we did it. <laughs> well, have a good night. Thank you, Jessica, you too. Bye. Bye.